The story so far, I am porting Fusix to the ESP8266. After a couple of false starts, I have the kernel booting a working file system on the internal flash using the Dara FTL library. Uh, the file system will mount, I can load and execute binaries from it, and in it is running up to the point where it's forking and trying to run a subprocess. The uh, ha, pressed the wrong button and managed to kill my PDF reader. Just put that back again. This is the extensor LX106 documentation. Do, maybe do control Z, not control backslash. Uh, so uh, the forking process is working up to the point where it swaps out the current process so that the new child process can replace it. It successfully, well, I think it's successfully swapping the process out, uh, but then it crashes immediately afterwards. So this is what it gets when it crashes. I will hit the reset button, which is there. And that's it swapping out the process rather slowly. And there it fails. So let's investigate this and see if we can figure out what's going on and how to fix it. And in the process, let's try and sp like, let's try and speed this up a bit. I'm not sure if we can. So where is the here we go? ESP8266 swapper. So what that's doing from the the numbers are the debug tracing is it swapping out the current process. It uh, allocates a new block in the swap partition. It writes out the UData block, which describes the process. It writes out all the code, which is 64K. And then it writes out all the data, which is 31.5K. Now, we could swap out only part of the process. We know uh, we know let me just find the UData structure. We know how much of the kernel's data space is actually being used by the kernel's data space. Processor's data space is actually being used by the process. The way traditional Unixes work, of which this is one, is that in user memory a process gets to use everything from the bottom up to it's not the right structure this is the right structure up to the break point which is defined by this variable now the uh, the break point can be modified by calling the brook instruction uh, brook system call or s brook system call which adjusts this up or down. If you adjust it up, it allocates more memory from the kernel for the process, and if you allocate down, it releases it. The way our platform works here, we have a fixed size 64K block, which is used by the current process. So what this does is it just defines a point in the memory space, uh, and that's about it. But we do know that the process should only be using data below that. Now, it would be easy enough to just write out everything from the bottom to the break address. The problem is the stack. The stack extends downwards from the top of the data space. So Brook works up and the stack works down. And the that needs to be stored as well. We know where the stack point is going to be because it's defined here. So we could just write SP to top, which is the top of data memory, except that it is possible for the process to move its stack, at which point the assumption that the stack extends from 
here to here is invalid. So I think we could get away with it. Uh, at least until something odd happens. Actually, we can be a bit cleverer about this. If SP is above break, then we know that we must be using a traditional stack. If it's below break, then the process has obviously moved its stack somewhere else, which means that we only have to write uh, everything. We have to write everything because we don't know how much of the old stack the, the process is still using. Okay, this is this is doable. This is doable. So if udata.usp is less than udata.u break, then uh, using a custom stack architecture, we have to write out the entire space. So, copy the entire data block into swap. Otherwise, we want to uh, otherwise we write out the um, the bits that we think the the system's actually using. So we are going to say the stack offset from the bottom of the data space is USP minus database. So we want to copy U uh, break minus database. So that copies the uh, the main data, and then we want to copy uh, data. The thing is, the swap right routine writes a certain number of bytes at a particular block, and the stack pointer is very unlikely to be block aligned, so we're actually going to have to align that. I think there's an align macro. Uh, yes, there is. So we have to align it to and the number of blocks. We're then going to write the stack from uh, wait a minute, I've I've missed a parameter. So this is the length u break minus database, where u break is the top byte we want to write. Database is the base. Uh, the length of the stack is going to be uh, u data u top minus is that in, that is in bytes isn't it yes it is yeah that just calls the device driver to read or write an arbitrary number of bytes 
for to from the device. Yeah, so uh, so it should be like this. Let's just stick some more tracings in and then see it work. It's not working. Too few arguments to swap right. I have missed the comma one at the end, which does something mysterious I don't understand. Okay. The c this writes the code out. The code will also only occupy a fraction of the... Uh, panic... Swooper... Okay, this needs to be a aligned value. So we're going to use a line up uh, that's going to be aligned, that's going to be aligned. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, the kernel doesn't store how much text space there is, so that's going to take a while. That's what it's doing there, and then it fails. So we would either have to add something somewhere, probably in the UData block, to keep track of that, or something else. Uh, let's just have a quick look around. What is in here in terms of useful things? The top of memory is, of course, data memory. Uh, I'd rather not add something. We could. the uh, this is the binary loader this is the code that actually loads the binary off disk so this is the thing that knows how big the text area is it does copy some stuff into the udata block this is just doing IO it doesn't seem to copy the actual exec header, which would be useful. Um, this just tracks the stack pointer. This sets up the break address, which is just, you know, the top of data usage. Uh, yeah, I don't. Let's add something. This will make debugging easier because uh, actually, like loading stuff, we so much faster. Loading stuff, actually, uh, doing uh, test cycles where I do a build and run it, it will start up more quickly and therefore it'll be easier to iterate. So. to do you text top and we then want to add this to our configuration let's, let's 
call it that actually. Data dot new text top equals code base plus header a text. I believe that's right. Okay, and we want to clean because yep, uh, because the dependency system isn't quite smart enough to know that changing that file requires rebuilding everything. And so code len then becomes a line up view data view text top minus code base on block shift and let's see what this does. So it has to rebuild everything and fails. Let's see. Okay. So no change here, which is kind of what we expected. Now the issue with what we've done is we won't actually know whether it works or not. It's possible that we've actually made things worse in that it there are now more possible failure modes. We could be writing this stuff to the wrong place, therefore we won't know what we have to read out again. Uh, but you saw how much more quickly it did the fork. This will make a big difference to development and also to uh, flash lifetime because this system is going to swap a lot. Okay, it printed swap out done and then crashed. Swap out in this context is happening in do fork, which is here. So this happens there. So possible things that could, that could go wrong are everything from here down. So the next place that we're calling C is make proc. Um, yep. So let's edit make proc and add some tracing. It's in process.c. Hmm, I don't remember seeing that bit of tracing. Let's just try that again, shall we? If I hit the reset button, get ready to pause it. Uh, interesting. It stopped. That took a long time. I wonder if that was uh, Dara doing a garbage collection. 130 to 133 was the, the piece of code that that wrote the code segment. That could well have been a garbage collection. We'll see what it's like next time. Okay, so I see the... I see this line. Where does that come from? I do not see uh, this is this is characteristic of a double exception. The 
first exception oh I, I also see no fatal exception message up here so the exception handler appears to be crashing which is why we're getting a different V address however we're getting the same code I want to know where that comes from Was it LX? SB percent? Hmm. Uh, there was an OX there, so not there. Okay, well, let's do that. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're returning from the fork correctly. So where is do fork called from? Syscall proc. Here. So let's turn global debugging on for this file and give it another go and see what happens. And we start in it, swap out. Yeah, that was quicker. We must have been seeing Dara do a uh, garbage collect. Okay, we return from make proc. And then things went haywire. Now, we called make proc here, and at the end of this code, I know what's happened. I've forgotten to reload A0. Hey, look, I've forgotten to save A0. A0 is the link register. It contains the uh, the address to return to once the uh, subroutine exits. So we want to do this to i 0 sp 7 by 4 Without that, this ret will actually return to the last value but the last address returned to, which is here. So it'll have looped around this over and over again, and each time it goes through, it adjusts the stack pointer. So the stack pointer will uh, increase rapidly until it leaves the area of readable memory, and then there'll be a crash. Right, let's try that. And see what it does. In it, swap out, crash. Well, that did not help, but it's it's less wrong now. I'm not using swap seven anywhere. Okay, well. So the first thing that happens after returning from do frock, do do frock, do fork, is that we print some stuff. Therefore, the crash must be happening somewhere in this code. The error was a it was an exception 28 which is a address error so 
Where could that be going wrong? The only dereferences we're doing are here, where we're writing a value to run ticks, or one of these loads, which is stack relative. and then we restore the stack pointer, reload a0 and exit. So let's try turning off all of this and see what that does. This should give us just enough code that we can return from the subroutine. If this fails, I'll just try adding uh, trace messages. We start in it, we swap it out, and and aha. Uh -huh. Right. So do fork has returned and execution is continuing in the normal way. Well, I can see one bug, which is that should be a write, because we're trying to restore the SAR register. Where is run ticks? It's a int 16 in the kernel data. So that actually wants to be a S16. If that was unaligned, that could be causing the crash. I would have thought to get a different error, but let's try it. Yep, that was it. Okay, so do fork is returning. We are so last time it actually called switch in before failing, and now it's not. So interesting. Let's take a look at this. Uh, do fork. So we've got this message, we've got all the way down to here. Do fork returns to um, Interesting. I think this is returning. This will then return to the system call handler and try to continue on with uh, user code. Let's verify that by Just doing that, and trying this. Whoa. Uh, okay, it's spinning on something. Right, it has returned somewhere and everything is going horribly wrong. This gives us somewhere to look.
syscall 55 syscall names so this is 0 so I'm going to go 55 down wait pid Um, I wonder if this is the parent who's running and the parent is now waiting for the child to exit by calling wait pid but we haven't implemented something that is called that means that wait pid is not working it's not blocking Therefore, the uh, the parent process will be spinning, waiting for the child termination. So, we're waiting for PID. Search for an exited child. So uh, this will then loop through the process table looking for a child that's exited. If it doesn't find anything, we'll call psleep. And psleep will put the current process, which is the parent, to sleep. And then the child will get swapped in. So the stuff I said yesterday about in do fork in that the uh, the parent is swapped out would appear to be wrong. What seems to be happening is we're swapping out the child and the parent continues to run. That's a little bit inefficient. See, what's going to happen is in it will fork. This will cause the child to be swapped out. Then the then in it will go to sleep. So the parent will be swapped out, the child will be swapped in again, and then replaced with the new binary. If fork were to continue running in the child, then uh, we wouldn't have to, we would save a complete swap in out cycle. Of course, if you've got a memory management unit and you can have multiple processes in memory at once, this is not a problem. So let's scatter logging through there. Save and try that again. So where did we get to? We end at 3.50. Not found. Uh, okay. Uh, it cannot find... So it's asked to wait for PID 2. But it can't find a process with that ID. So this is pinning the blame on do fork somewhere. I think that we need to save the PID of the child process somewhere. Or we're returning the wrong one or something like that. So let's take another look at that. At the Atari ST version. And see what this does. Uh, now I'm trying to remember which way round parameters are. Okay, it's source destination clearly. So this is writing the stack pointer into USP.
we haven't done that. So we save our registers. A2 is pointing at the process structure. the wrong piece of code. <laughs> okay, two fork. Right, A0 is the... This is copying the first parameter into A0, which is the child process table. We save A2. Uh, load the child U data into A1. Why? What are we doing with A1? Oh, also the other thing I need to go do is go through and check to make sure these are 32-bit accessors. A0 is the child P tab. So for us, that's in A2. So this is loading the PID of the child and saving it onto the stack. This is the PID we are returning here. So we're saving it into stack into slot 5 and loading it here. Okay, let's check those okay well for a start this is a 16-bit value uh, USP is a 32-bit value UP tab is also going to be a 32-bit value because it's a pointer Okay, so this means we're actually returning the right value from for the PID. However, we could tell by the tracing when that something in the C code was obviously truncating the wrong value we were uh, working with to 16 bits. So I don't think that was what was causing our problem. So let's just look for anything to do with the PID. This, oh yeah, 16 bit. So this is the child U data, which we are getting from. Here, no. Okay, this is something else we're doing wrong. Uh, this is, yeah, I think last time I forgot to register that this is getting the child's UData pointer. UData, of course, is pointing at the current processor's UData. So that's going to be L32i A3 A2 being the child's P tab. P U data offset. Uh, 
And why are we writing that to the child stack pointer? That's just wrong. What on earth was I doing? So we have pushed the child's uData onto the stack. And that is in fact what's happening here. So let's save that into slot six by four. And uh, no, actually. Um, this is, uh, this is getting the, the current processors tab pointer and we're swapping out the current process is that correct right this piece of code is the wrong piece of code uh, I don't want to look at that because that's the um, that's for a flat memory map model that's why it doesn't look familiar that's a flat memory, memory map model with no swap in it. So I let's take a look at the... Uh, is there an 8080? No. Uh, MS6? Okay, yeah, I think this was the one I was looking at. Switch out, do fork. Right. So, the U area is live as the parent U area. This is, yep, HL is the new process P tab which we're saving to a global variable there. To prepare the return value in the parent process, we're getting the PID from the parent. This is happening here. This can be 16. This is actually the parent PID, isn't it? No, it's not. It's the child PID because we're actually fetching this relative to the P tab that we are passed in. Okay. So that's correct. Save the stack pointer and the critical registers. Yes. We haven't saved the stack pointer. That will be in the child's, no, that will be in the UData block. Right, we do need to write the current stack into the current comes back in the
Uh, I think I am doing this wrong. See, this is saying that it always returns as the child, and what we were seeing code it was always returning as the parent. So. We want to copy the current stack pointer into the parent's udata. So we need to get a pointer to udata. So A3 udata. S32i store U data USP offset. Save parents U data. Okay. We then swap out the current process. This is not a swap system, so it's not doing swap out. Uh, how about the MSP430? Because that did actually work, I remember, I remember. And I wrote it, so I should at least remember how it works. So save registers. Save the child PID. Yeah, R12 is the input parameter. So that's loading the PID out of the child P tab pointer. Save registers, save stuff. Put the stack pointer into the current UData block. That's this. I don't even know if we need to save this. We're not using it anywhere else. And besides, we're about to reuse that stack block. Okay. Okay, so save the parent process to disk. We want to save the parent ptab, uh, the child ptab, onto the stack so we can swap out the. Yeah, this. A3 is pointing at the parent's U data. This swaps out the parent. Okay. Now we're the child. Yes. We are the child. Make proc here. Is going to set up the current U data, which, if you remember, is a copy of the parents. Well, it is the parents. We've just saved the parent to disk, and that's saved the parents U data to disk. So we're going to turn the current U data into the child's. Uh, right. This takes the A2 is already the child's PTAB pointer because we saved this here. 
So this is that comment's wrong. Right, so this will set up the current UData to point at the child's PTAB that we passed in. This is the child, therefore we are not returning the child PID here. We're returning zero. Okay, that seems much more plausible. L16i. L16. I'm sure there was an L16i instruction. UI unsigned int. Uh, that just means it's zero extended rather than sign extended. So what's this going to do? Swap out. Right. What happened? Fork has returned. It has said etc rc colon unknown error. Excellent. It's tried to load the rc file and has failed. This is correct. Okay. Uh, let's get rid of this tracing because it's junk. Let's keep the process tracing. Um, I'm going to need to copy a file onto the file system, probably several. And it's panicking on platform switch in because we haven't implemented that. What's happened is the child is terminating and then it's tried to switch back to the parent. Uh, ETCRC, that's the RC shell configuration file. This is a shell script. Has it just tried to run? Has it just forked into the shell? It can't have because I don't. Unless this is the SSH shell, then I haven't actually implemented that bit yet. Okay, well, let's put RC in. And now's probably the time to add some of these. So let's put in, uh, let's put in these actually. Look. Set date not there. 
Knee mount, not there. Crook root is there. Okay. Cat. Forsook. Let's have F disk as well. I'm being absurdly optimistic here. Uh, Prut root. Yes. Um, I should probably at some point try and build the shell. Uh, I wonder how many of these things I actually have space for. Right, that's just showing the number of free sectors on the logical f on the in the FTL partition. Okay, we run out of space. So let's Actually, we've run out of space. Uh we can make the partition bigger. We can probably size it up by 50%. So we have to unmount that first. Okay, that's done. Disk file system image. So let's actually it has told us exactly how many we can have. One four six five K. Four six just to be on the safe side. File system dot image. System dot image two New primary two full size. So we're now we're now a megabyte. Write that. How does this feel? Uh, I wonder if I actually need to. Increase the size, increase this. I don't actually know what these numbers mean, which is a bit annoying. I kind of have no idea what I'm doing. I don't think we've got a megabyte worth of binaries now I think about it. They're all very small. Well, they have to be. They need to be under 64K. All right. Some of these some of these applications have moved since that script was kept up to date. So let's just clip those out because you haven't built them. So uh, patch CPM. PS. I thought PS would be in utils. Yeah, it's right there. Oh, right, and yet yeah, now it's run out of space. Do 
do we want to double this size again? At some point, where it will actually be too big, so... Okay, that actually seems to be behaving, so let's just put that up to six. Uh oh. Okay, this this will leave uh Okay, that will leave five sectors. Actually I'm gonna crank that down again. I want to leave a certain number of sectors free to give the FTL some working space. So, util u mount, where does that go? Right, I think the file system is just full at this point. Can I double this again? No. Right, I don't think that number does what I thought it did, so let's put that down to there. Nope. Well, it fit, we know it fit. Yeah, okay, let's go with that. Um, I'm also slightly wondering whether I want to increase the number of swap slots, because there's only four, but uh, I need to uncomment these. This will fail because some of these don't exist anymore. LN, MV, patch CPM, SH and Levy. Okay, so let's write that. Okay, and that's going to take a while. Uh, we, we can make the file system bigger. I think this is only two megabytes worth of flash. Yes, it is. We've actually got three to work with. Well, actually, we've got four megabytes of flash, but I'm using the first megabyte for code. We don't have anything like that much code. Let's just look to see how much code we've got. 47k of code. Well, uh, yeah, 40, 47, 47k. So we have loads of space. We can actually use very nearly all of the four megabyte flash for our file system, which is quite nice. That will give loads of space for a system like Fusix. We could probably even get a compiler in there. So I believe that we got to the point where it was trying to switch in the new process. So while this is flashing quite slowly, let's take a look at this. Switch in text align four. Um, it's the it takes the process pointer ptab of process to switch in. So this should be relatively straightforward. Fork is the trickiest. 
What's this doing? This is uh. Switch. Why is Ah, okay, okay, what I seem to have done, this is a bit odd. Why did I do that? Switch out. Tell you what, I think that my source, that the MSP430 code in my source base is contaminated. So let's take a look at the upstream version. Kernel MSP430 tricks.s. Where is so we switch out. Now apparently it's calling platform switch out. This could be part of the overlay stuff that I did. The MSP430 was a bit special and I was a bit over enthusiastic about doing weird optimizations, which means it's more complicated than it should be. Okay, that has written two megabytes. Let's just look for platform switch out, see where that appears. Uh, Process.c calls it. Ah, okay, okay. Right, the MSP430 code is right. So platform switch out is the code that swaps out the current process and swaps in another process. And it looks like what I did here was the switch but to delegate nearly all the logic into switch in. So what switch in does is uh, it looks to see if the current process needs to be swapped out and if so it does it and then it switches in the new process. So all platform switch out does is to call get proc and then fall through into switch in in order to do the work. So let's just nuke that and duplicate some of this Code platform switch out, switch in. So we've got platform switch out and switch in. Now platform switch out is going to Set the return code, which will be returned by fork, to zero. Now we we are going to want to create a stack frame with the same structure as this. So we're actually going to copy nearly all this code. Looks 
same order that do fork does it. Uh, now, this is only going to matter, this return code, if... Hang on, hang on. child right the return code from switch out will only ever be non-zero if uh, there is no return code so yeah, okay, switch in returns. What switch in will return is either the return code which is set by switch out, which is going to be irrelevant because switch in to switch in return anything because switch in doesn't return anything. Yeah. Uh, the other situation is when we've called fork. When we do the switch in, we're actually going to return into the context that just called do fork, and we want, and we are the parent, and we want to return the child processor's PID. But in that situation, the parent process will not have gone through switch out. So we don't need to save a five. That's just going to be garbage. Oh, we, sorry, we don't need to save the return code because it's just going to be ignored. So Save the stack pointer. Find the next process to run. Is get proc? It does get proc still exist? Yep. Uh, call zero get proc. Call through into switch in. Okay. Uh, our A2 is the PTAB pointer of the process to run. Okay, now we need to duplicate this logic. Uh, compare the swap page. Is this... Are we the current process? I think this is what this is saying. If we have not been swapped, then... just start running because everything is set up correctly. So, is the new process actually swapped out? Um, what is a P page? The page is a uint 16. Uh, A2 is the process pointer, so we want p tab p page offset. Uh, b e q n z. No. I can't remember how this thing does branches. E E Q branch if equal immediately branch if equal to zero B 
E N E Z. Yeah. Uh, right. If if a three is not zero, jump to not swapped. Now, uh, this says that we're using simple.c. And the swapper is going to swap in a process. It's where it's swapped out manually. Do we need to swap out the current process? Um, yes, of course, what it says here about the stack is correct. We are currently running from the processor's kernel stack and swapping stuff in is going to overwrite it. So we can't do that. We're going to have to create a new stack. Which we're going to need to switch to. Now, because we've got our own swapper, it might be possible to use to simply modify the swapper instead. So that swap in swaps out the current process. That would save us from having to do stuff in assembly. This is not a lot of logic, so we can simply do uh, if does current ah, current process need swapping out if you data you p tab dot uh, p page If it is not zero, swap out you p tab. And then we swap in the new code. Okay, yes, panic. In. But we do need to switch to the new swap stack, so uh, in the switch to the swapper stack and swap in the new process. By SP to swap stack plus uh, stack end. We can probably make it smaller than the five twelve bytes. Uh, A two is still pointing at the the ptab pointer of the new process so we just want to call swap in this will then copy the new process in and the new processors udata into memory Uh, 
Why is that called Swapper? Called from switching, we discover we want to run a swap process. We let page map alloc cause any needed swap out of idle processes. Page map alloc may cause a swap out. Okay, so we want to call swapper. And then this will do the work of actually swapping something in. Right. I have a feeling that this code has changed since the since I wrote the MSP430 stuff. Uh, P status. Are we going to make it running in this piece of code? No, apparently we're not. So make the new process runnable. Uh, and we will actually need to save the um, we will need to save A2 onto the new stack. We can't use this stack frame because we've just shifted to a new stack. So right. be nice to do this from C, but we are having to tinker with SP. So make the new process runnable. Yes, I think that's a that's a byte. That's S eight I new process P tab storing a storing a three new process P tab P tab P status offset. Okay. So the processor's UData has now is now in the UData block. So all we're going to do is simply load load the original stack pointer. Now this will have been saved either here or here. This means that this block is on the stack. So we can return it, we can restore it with basically this code. So we set run ticks to zero. This is this counts how long a process has been running. We reload the these parameters. Uh, the parent process needs to needs to return the PID of the child, which is in slot. Five, so two i a two s p five by four.
and exit. Okay, I think that is all we need. Uh, Really? Can I do EQ? Apparently I can't do EQ. It might be possible to be able to allocate a buffer from the kernel for this. But let's try this for the time being. Uh, 41, invalid, right, we haven't defined this. This needs to go in, there's actually going to be several of these. Uh, this one, 56, and this one. And that's offset. So these are going to have to go here. And we do have that one. We don't have this one. equal to p status. Okay, um, let's just have a look and see if we can guess what that should be. Oh yeah, and we also need to set uh, define p running one status is the first so that should be right okay what time do we build it nothing 41 p page offset okay there's another one So if PID is 4, UID is 6, 8, 12, uh, 16, 20, 24, I think. saving these onto the stack so and we don't actually have to retract back from the stack pointer because we're about to discard the stack pointer completely when we reload it here tricks.s unknown opcode call zero okay okay um And I think we don't need to do this as swapper.c is now doing it. 
I think. All right. This is probably going to fail immediately on start up, and it's not. I managed to do my mental arithmetic correctly. And. And. Come on. Uh, right, okay. Panic swap in. Right, it got to here. It tried to swap something in. It's still saying unknown error 13 when it comes to RT. But let's write our swap in routine. Let's actually do a bit of clean up. Actually, let's just use ints, they'll be faster. Are we using page anywhere? Yes, we are. So this is going to be almost the same logic. Let's swap in if no page. Um, okay, right, we now need to do our reads. And we're going to read the entire space and what should we swap read? Yep, that should do. We're reading the entire data because I believe that reads are much faster than writes. And that's just, you know, try it first and see what happens. I still don't like that unknown error 13. But let's try it and it fails. Uh, what's you? It's the it's right. It's where we're swapping to, which is going to, of course, be U data. I am a little surprised about why this isn't using swap read or swap write. To be honest, don't think there's any reason why it's not. I just cut and pasted this from somewhere else. So anyway. see what this does. Swapping out, swapping in. Taking, oh, swapping done. Okay. Well, I'm not quite sure what it did. But it did a thing. Let's clone this to make the reads faster. So where does it go from swap 
in well we're in swapper.c well rather we're in swap.c we're in the swapper function so let's turn on some tracing there uh, this should then return to whatever process it was that'll be weight pid I think we still have tracing on here we do let's give that a go actually before we do that let's take a look at those warnings and see if there's anything useful swapper.c in bytes um 120 that's a warning that needs fixing T Uh, 103 is, it, is the kernel's a bit inconsistent about whether it uses a u adra t which is a integer or a void star uh, in file included from swap at c29 expected u size t but argument is oh, right that's the that's this. One five four. Uh, honestly, this code could be commoned out really easily. Just need to pass in a pointer to either swap read or swap write. Let's try that. Let's try that. Okay, that builds cleanly. So let's see what it does. I mean, it'll fail in the same way, I hope, just with different messages. Right, so that's the swapper telling us what it wrote. And then it hangs. No, it didn't hang. Intriguing. So it wrote 2560 bytes at this address. Then it wrote 44544. That's not right. Stack O. Oh. oh, that's stupid. Uh. Yeah, let's cop. Let's let's uh, comment this out. We want the block. The the u data and
one of these. Yeah, let's change this to a call to our all-purpose swapping out function. We swap dev block data len is obviously new data blocks. Uh, address is u1. So here we just replace all this with swap in out block u swap right. And this becomes swap in out block u int 8 d star u data as swap read. Okay, let's see what this does. Um, passing for of read write makes integer from pointer one, two, three, four. Yep, that wants to be a U adder T. Yeah. Okay. Right, so it's no longer writing 48k of junk. So, let's see. Panic swooper. At least this does explain why the swapping in and out was so slow. There's far too much data. Doesn't explain why this is quite slow. Okay, so you can see here it has written the UData area, which is that address. Data stack code. read if we read too much at this address then we'll overwrite the ROMs workspace and all kinds of terrible things will happen. This does seem to not be doing a lot so I think it might have failed.
Yeah, okay. This number seems wrong. Because there's only 32,000 blocks in a swap. Hang on. This is writing the code. Each block is 512 bytes, so that's actually 128k from the beginning of the swap partition, which is kind of way too much. Um, that's this calculation here. So start of swap area, number of blocks in the U data, which is 1, length of the data segment, which is 64k in blocks. That's the start block. This seems to be OK. Uh, 1024 bytes is 400 in hex, so that will go up to the end of the data block, uh, the data area. So 64. Ooh, wow did a thing. Interesting. Uh, 64k divided uh, right shift by 512 is divided by 512 is 128 uh, yes I had multiplied rather than divided in my head that is the right number so I'm not quite sure what this is, was doing for all that time. It seems to have been perfectly happy to do it, so let's just put our syscall tracers back. Data you all know. PID is new data p tab p PID. No, it's not. It's u p tab. This will show the 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 PID of that made the system call, which should give us information about what's going on. Okay. System calls, swap out. Long pause with no system calls. I wonder if this is Dara frantically garbage collecting. Okay. So we're here is PID one. This is in it. We've done the fork. We're now in PID two, which is whatever it is that in it ran. That's correct. Whatever it is has just failed, and has swapped back in the thing that was swapped at 288, so it swapped in it back in. So we have successfully forked, run a process, and it swapped in the parent. I, it, I don't believe it has returned from the parent. I have no idea what in it is doing, but I don't see a call to to I don't see a syscall end. Yes, I do. It's there. That's exit. So I would expect to see a from here a syscall ret, 
which is the other half of the fork that's happened here. So this is, we haven't seen PID1 return from this fork. That should be happening here. So this makes me think that given that the swap in worked, uh, then this code is failing in some description. We haven't exercised this yet. So what could be going wrong? We are the new process. The swap in has succeeded. We reload A2. which is the p tab of the new process, which in this case is the parent. We make it runnable. We restore the stack pointer. So if this is wrong, then everything will go belly up further down. This is the parent, which means that the thing we're loading here is the thing that got saved here. So it's a eight slot stack frame with this stuff on it. So eight slots stuff. We haven't seen an exception. So what kind of tracing can we put in? Uh, we can write out bytes to the, yeah, let's do a movi A265 call zero uh, A3 ETS put C a3, this will print an A and spin. And while we are at it, let's put some stuff in here. Printf Dara right oh, LPA Dara read and let me also put in Dara arrays. Uh, So this is actually going to return, it's going to display physical blocks, whereas the other tracing is going to show logical sectors. Oops. If it's spending all its time erasing, then we may be able to help that by switching to 64k raise blocks. Well, that's it reading in it. Swapping in and out. Okay. Well, that was a lot faster than it was last time. Let me have a quick scan. Here's read. This is reading the binary. Uh, 
read, read, read. So here it's swapping out. We erase physical block 21, 22, 23, 24. Honestly, I think that's fine. All right, so we have reached the end of we've got our A which means we've reached the end of this so we should have returned to wherever do fork was called from so here there, so we should be seeing this tracing, but we're not, which means that the ret has failed somehow, which makes me think that uh, this stuff is going wrong. We have incorrectly restored the process, and the U data or stack data is all wrong. Now swap right. Uh, oh, I've lost the swap in. Did swap in tracing. Let's do that again then, shall we? of copies. This is it, garbage collecting. Okay, so this is what I wanted to see. Uh, we have red. This is our U data. Somewhere up here, we can see, yep, yeah, AD80, 512 bytes. So we read that. We read our data. We read the user stack. We read the text. Okay, so I want to verify that the U data here is valid, uh, but I don't want to put tracing here because that would be hard. So let's put it here and swap in. So we can do. Um, it equals this should u data dot u p pointer p pid and u data dot u s p. What else would be? sensible. I think that's probably all we need. Uh, ah, what's it called? P tab. So if these two values are correct, then that means that the U data block has been re restored correctly. More garbage collection. 
the reason why Dara has got this copy operation is that some NAND chips can do fast copies internally. But I don't think this is one of them. Uh, yeah, I think I need to shrink the file system because it's, there aren't enough free blocks for Dara to do a good job. Certainly seems to be spending a lot of time doing garbage collection. A lot of time doing garbage collection. Yeah, I've run out of things to say, just waiting for this to finish, whatever it's doing. It seems to be shuffling nearly all the flash around, which is odd. There's only 512 arrays blocks. You can see we've already done like 300. Well, if if the numbers that we should eventually get look right, then um, the problem will be something in this code, in that the the values w that we are restoring are all wrong. Therefore, as soon as we do the ret, it jumps into nowhere. I am surprised if go. weird. So, uh, PID1, stack pointer, that. That's the wrong stack pointer. Uh, that's the Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's the user stack pointer. That's that's a very round number. Uh, three F F F seven D. That that is indeed a user address. But that's so the swapped out process should be in the kernel stack. Now we can tell where the UData block is because it the, the address is printed here. So the UData block is 512 bytes from this address. And the kernel pointer, the, the stack pointer when system calls are executed is in that block. The old stack pointer is stored in the exception frame, which is on the user stack. So when our do fork happens, the stack pointer that we're saving here onto the into the UData structure is a kernel stack pointer and should be pointing above this address. This is below, no wait, wait, 
this is below that address. The PID is right, but this is not. OK, this gives us some data to work with. For a start, we could simply go here and do that. This will show us the stack pointer that gets written to disk so that we can verify that it's the same when it comes out again. So we know that uh, we know that things are returned correctly when do fork exits. And we're not changing the stack pointer here at all. I mean, it, we're not changing stacks. We're obviously moving the stack pointer up and down. Which suggests that the saved value here is somehow wrong. But we are actually saving the current stack pointer onto the UData block. So, and then we're calling UData uh, swap out. So unless the stack will be restored at this state, not at the state it was in swap out. So OK, let's give this a go and just see what it does. Hopefully, you shouldn't need to wait that long. So it's in it. OK, it's now swapping out. Oh, we have to wait for that to finish. Oh, another garbage collection. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to give 64k arrays blocks a try. We may even get more space in the file system that way. And I'm also going to try shrinking the file system because this is clearly not right. Alright, what's this done? Same stack pointer there. Uh, swap out done, stack pointer is 3FFF7000. That is the bad stack. Oh, right, so. Uh, do fork is somehow inside swap out then the value saved here is wrong somehow how can that be wrong we've switched to the kernel stack we did that in sub Unix is call. Cool. 
Wait a minute, what the... What on earth? How... This can't be right. We allocate a stack frame. We save the stack pointer onto the... Wait, we... S a2 is the exception frame. We store the stack in the exception frame. We change stacks. We call Unix syscall. A2 does not contain the exception frame anymore. That's complete nonsense. Uh, Right. I'm not sure how we ever actually managed to make a system call. That was better. Still not right, and the numbers were all wrong, but this is still clearly the wrong address. So if I go up here to here we are, syscall n32, this is, this is our fork. Um, kernel stack pointer here, user stack pointer here. Kernel stack pointer is in the exception frame, so that is here. No, it's not. That's the user stack pointer. Uh, kernel stack pointer is approximately here. It's, it's difficult to get exactly, but this will this will return the address to a local variable which is on the current stack frame. So the user stack pointer is going to be there. So let's try that. Honestly, if I pause that and scroll up, um, kernel stack pointer, yes, no, maybe that does not look right. The user stack pointer is kind of garbage. That value has changed. It is the right value. I mean, it's the one that we saved. So, okay, 12. Zero four eight twelve. Yeah, stack pointer is here. And then we call Unix syscall with this in A two. So Unix syscall gets the stack frame in well A two. Which is the first parameter. which wait a minute 
Wait a minute. This call handler CB. That that stub is never being called. This is always being executed on the user stack. Which means that whenever we do a swap in or an exec, we're going to be erasing the stack we're currently executing from, which is very bad. This is called handler trampoline. It's called handler CP. This doesn't want to be static anymore. Uh, there so that's uh, I need to call the stub so extern fnc exception handler t syscall handler trampoline like so syscall handler trampoline Call not syscall handler cb. Actually, it's no longer a callback, so it's just a syscall handler. Right. Let's see what this does. This should now switch to the kernel stack. The difference between the. Uh, that's not so good. This suggests that this is all wrong somehow. And of course putting this in A15 is wrong because that's not going to... We do actually need to save... A15. So let's just save A2 into slot 0, store the stack pointer into the exception frame, No, that doesn't help. Um, we have to do that here. So that here we can load A2 back out of the frame and then load uh, the stack pointer from it which allows us to ret but we're doing a call so we also have to save a zero here we also have to load it from the stack frame Oof, that's hopefully it'll maybe work now. Or not. Okay, can I get away without this? Uh, I don't want to be on the user stack when I do exec because we are going to be writing all over that bit of memory. So we do have to switch stacks. And I believe that this is the best place to do it.
course it's not working this saves the exception frame switch to the kernel stack allocate a structure off the kernel stack which is 16 bytes save the exception frame structure onto the kernel stack save a zero onto the kernel stack call the thing reload both things change stacks back to the user stack and return well let's see if we get here ETS put C or let's see a three J dot Okay, we haven't got there. Yeah, that's a good thing because that means it's more likely that this code works. So this code is actually exec. Which is this. Now, there is no debug tracing, so we're just going to have to add some. During the execution of this, we are on the boot stack, which is way up the top of memory. Uh, at some point I would like to reclaim that to because we, are, we only use it on startup and it's never touched again and there's enough space there to put a number of file system buffers that would make a lot of things better uh, but um, now the Platform do exec. Is it do exec that we have problems with? It could well be. So let's just do that. And this is in low level do exec. Yeah. Right, we've just called do exec. Uh, we bypass the whole system call return stuff and just jump straight into the new code. There's not enough here to be wrong, honestly. So that suggests that what's happening is that it's calling this code and then this is crashing. So let's put this here and see what this does. So if we're calling user code and then the user code is trying to make a system call and then this is going wrong somehow, then hopefully this will show what's happening. Aha! Something new! Well, that's not a valid program counter. This looks fine. Call X is the indirect call instruction. So we load the address of the put C ROM function. We call it. We're not doing anything stupid like loading this. I'd love to be able to load from a memory in one instruction. 
from a constant address. But this does look like code. Has it dereferenced this? I think it might have. Okay, so this is our let's disassemble our our kernel. And you want to look for syscall handler trampoline. And the address is little endians, let's go right to left. 4C12 31D8. Okay, it's de uh, it's dereferenced this. It's treated this as a pointer and dereferenced it. Ah. Friends don't let friends define function pointers that are function types that are pointers. The oh, hang on, no, I need to clean. Uh, the C language will automatically convert from a reference to a function to a function pointer. Uh, and it will do this well enough that you most of the time you don't notice whether you're using one or the other, except the times when you do. And this was one of the ones where you do. Okay, declared as function returning a function. That's because it will return the old function pointer, which you don't care about, so let's just do that. In fact, you can put this as, a, as one of those and that would be better, but it makes no difference. So what's this going to do? Right. It's called the right thing. So let's take this out and run it again and see what happens. So read and fall over. We've called do exec. We are in the bind uh, in the uh, user code. Let's call. Let's just get rid of that line of tracing, which we don't need anymore. Let's look at our stacks. This is a kernel stack pointer. This is a user stack pointer. Thumbs up there. Uh, we are now doing a thing. What is syscall six? Unlink. I'm not sure if syscall name is in the kernel. address uh, image dot this we are in mem copy we're in the eight bit mem copy what is our virtual address? Nine. Okay, I thought that was going to be code data again. Anyway, let's. Okay, syscall name is not defined.
So why would this be crashing? Okay, anyway, this is nothing's actually changed. We just now have better error messages. Um, so we've gone into unlink. We're doing a couple of of sector reads, and then it's dying. Now the big difference between what we're doing now and what we were doing before is we're on the kernel stack. So let's do this. and see what happens. Now we're not changing stacks. If this behaves differently... Right. Uh, it doesn't like us being on the kernel stack. Chances are that we've run out of stack space. That's what that usually means. If you switch back and everything is fine, then... Hmm. Well, let's see what this does. It's not going to work properly because we're going to be scribbling over the stack when we swap the thing in, but... Well, once that finishes garbage collecting... So, if we need to make the stack bigger, the kernel stack bigger, we are going to have to... double this double this. Okay, yep, that's failed. The swap size is now 32.5k. It's 31.5 plus now 1 for the... because this has increased to a kilobyte. So, where is what size used? I don't know for either whether I can use a 0.5 there. I don't think I can. No, I can't. So... Well, this is uh, this is how much user code there is. So, if we increase the size of the U data block again to one and one and a half k, it's now three blocks long. This is now one point five, and this is a round number again. We have lost a stack, a swap slot because I configured it on the file system for four slots of the old size. So now there's only room for three. I'll have to reconfigure it, but I'm going to have to do that again at some point anyway. Uh, So let's put these back, switch back to the kernel stack. I wonder how many places I've hard coded a 512. Oh, that needs to be different. New block size. Uh, this needs to be different. Um, how many places in Swapper did I assume the size of the U data? He 
does. That is length. Okay. Okay, I think I'm good. So clean. And build and write. And it all goes horribly wrong because... Uh, because they have that stupid 0.5. So this is going to have to be uh, 33, 64 plus 31.5 plus 1.5. As it is late, Thirty-three. Yep. And let's see how this goes. Okay, that is better. We've given it loads of stack space. I'm actually a little bit surprised it hasn't run out of memory. But I think we have a good amount of kernel memory. Wait for that stupid garbage collection. Um, I don't know how much we have left, actually. Uh, this is not going to help. I need to use NM. So, uh, okay, here is our user code. Uh, our kernel memory starts at starts here. So here are all our kernel variables. Somewhere there will be udata. Uh, okay. We have got, we've got fr up until C000. So actually we've got 2K left. Oh, here's udata. And there's our swap stack. So I don't know where our buffers are or how big they are. Yeah, these are the two 512 byte buffers used by Dara. Buff pool, here we go. Uh, it's a decent size, decent size. So we've got some space to increase it a bit, but we probably shouldn't because I, we are going to need to add some more functionality to the kernel. Uh, we can get rid of that system call name table, which will save some space. Okay. Right, here we go. Swapped in. Do fork. Excellent. We have successfully restored the state of a process. Uh, call proc. So we have returned from here. And we should have seen a syscall ret, but we haven't. So something else is wrong. That's, that's not good. Why is that there? That is a very not good number. That is a number that I do not wish to see. Okay, B600 is the stack pointer. Oh, right. 
what's happened is that USP is not the uh, user stack pointer anymore, it's the kernel stack pointer. So our optimization here is invalid. So as always, premature optimization, root of all evil, etc, etc, etc. That was definitely my bad. So let's try this and see what happens. And a garbage collect. But let's scroll up and see if our numbers look right. UData block, 1536. And we're erasing lots of blocks. Luckily we can keep this one, which saves us a bit. But having to write out all that 64k is not so great. Uh, yes, I do not know how to get the the real user stack pointer to be honest I don't think there are any system calls that require it so, uh, so other than this we should be quite happy to it for it to live in this stack frame somewhere in the user stack I don't know how f uh, user processors are supposed to allocate stack. I think, let's take a look at one of these other, well that's garbage collecting. So, there is a field in the header, which is the stack hint. A stack hmm which is apparently not used by anybody all right let's take a look at the 32-bit version What's this used by? It allocates a... Right, when using this format, I believe it puts the stack pointer, the stack down next to the BSS. And it's a fixed size. We could do that, that would allow us to save the user space in one chunk. It would mean that we wouldn't be able to increase the stack if a user need, if a user process needed it. But I don't think there's a way to do that anyway. It's, it's, yeah, this is still putting everything right at the top of the user memory. Okay, was this doing anything? No. Okay, that's it swapped. Now it's reading the process back in. And let's hold that, because that went wrong. Okay. User area. 64k of data, which takes a while, 8k of code, it 
we are returning from a system call and then we crash here So what's this? It's not this. Four zero two one two six FC. Interesting. So that's trying to write registers to the exception frame. And it's crashing because A2 here is null. 1, 4 is hex uh, for 20. It's got a 2 from the stack. This suggests that we have somehow corrupted the kernel stack on exit and as a result it's failed to reload the exception handler uh, the exception frame properly the exception frame lives in user code but this stack frame it's been loading it from is in kernel space kernel stack area so let's take a look at this uh we're restoring the stack B610. We've saved the stack B610, so it is at least the right stack. B610 is... within the bounds of the U, the kernel stack block. So we should have successfully loaded that. Possibilities for not loading it are that we are on the wrong stack which means it somehow got corrupted we we'll switch in swap stack plus swap stack size save onto the stack, we don't need to do that Oh, <laughs> I'm an idiot. Let's switch stacks. Then let's save the stack frame onto the stack frame. Right. A15 is saved up here and is going to be restored further down so we don't need to explicitly save it. should be a mov, this is going to be sba15 uh, restore old nope we actually let's take a look at that old code yeah we are putting the stack back where it was 
we want to stay in the swapper stack in fact yes because we can't put the stack the stack pointer back to where it was because after we've reloaded the process then the stack pointer's moved so we stay in the swapper stack until we get to here now in the case when it's not swapped then the stack pointer won't change because we're, we're still in the same process. I don't actually know when that happens. Okay, so that ought to be better. However, let's take another look at the swapper. I think we're going to have to say, to make this feasible at all, is uh, let's say 3k. They can have 3k, nothing else. So this is going to be write out the data area so data len minus uh, data len minus user stack into blocks you top uh, the address is actually going to be database plus user stack and the length is going to be user stack uh, yep okay Hang on, that was a suggest parentheses around you know, yeah. So read in it. And what's this complaining about? This is this a ROM code exception. Because uh, that's just rubbish. Database plus user stack blocks. No user stack. So for this, we want to write out um, um. Yes, it's just data len minus user stack in blocks database plus user stack no the length goes first the length goes first user stack.
Come on, I want this to work. Okay. Read. Right. Slowly. Read and crash. Right, we swapped in the process. The stack pointer in the UData block is B610. It's correct. We've got the right stack pointer. Uh, and we die at this address. which is here. We failed to make the new process runnable, which is this, because A2 is corrupted because we didn't save it across the call to swapper. Okay. So uh, yes, we can use our trick to save a to the poorly save register. So this is now a 15. Okay. So swap out. At great length. Yeah, um, I'm going to fix this offline because it's going to require reflashing probably multiple times until I get it right. And as you know, fi fiddle with long and slow tests to see what makes a difference. So I'm just going to live with it until the end of this session, which I'm hoping is going to be really soon now. Come on. I really don't know what it's doing. I might file a bug report with Daro because I cannot think of any sensible reason why it needs to copy stuff like this. I mean, all it's going to do is use up erasers. It does claim that it uses... Here we go. Uh, that crashes. That's our usual double exception. I was a bit a bit slow. Here we go. Dara does claim that it has perfect wear leveling so that every uh, no two arrays blocks will have a wear differing from one. But if it's artificially trying to wear it, that's not really how it's supposed to work. Okay. We've returned from the system call. We've reached this call red, which is not the same thing. And we crash here. Oh, look, it's there.
Uh, so this is different now. This address. This is the virtual address that caused the error. And this is pointing at the ROM. So I wonder if EF is now pointing at the ROM and it's trying to do the right and then it's failing. Uh, I wonder if... Uh, the... Is it trying to cache... The... Yeah, it's in a register. So any corruption of the kernel stack will cause that to be read back incorrectly. The actual place where that is going to be stored is going to be somewhere obscure in the uh, in the chain of stack frames, because that register is actually going to be saved probably by uh, the Unix syscall function, which this is calling here. So the the registers we're saving here are not the same ones that the uh, that could be getting corrupted. But if it was getting corrupted, then I doubt that it would have managed to make its way down the stack tree, uh, stack chain, to get to here. Yes. Well, I just want to see what these say. Uh, unfortunately, adding those trace messages will have changed the code. That always happens. In particular, the values will now be saved across the call to kprintf. Actually, there was a call there before anyway, so that shouldn't make a difference. So here we call Unix syscall. This is where the call to kprintf happens. Hmm. It would be nice if Fuzix was smart enough to know that it can just reload the text from the uh, the binary file. It would have to keep the inode open for that. I don't naturally have enough knowledge of physics's internals to know whether uh, that would be particularly expensive. Then we wouldn't have to save the text at all. Weirdly, on 8-bit systems, uh, reading stuff from disk is so fast because disks these days are SD cards that run way faster than the 8-bit micro so on an actual Z80 system it's just as cheap to load from disk as it is to do a mem set to clear to zero so there's actually no advantage to uh, saving part of the process uh, yeah, I should be calling memset to clear the middle section of the process, the the bit that's between the stack and the breakpoint, because a process could see data left by another process that just got swapped out. Okay. Ah. Come on. I mean, it's not as if this platform is even going to be slightly secure. Okay, and catch it. So, what's this done? Oh, it's crashed somewhere else now. Two seven O F. That's here. Oh, of course, it's going to crash there. I. Trying to dereference EF. Uh.
Okay, well, honestly, I'm going at this. I mean, I'm getting quite tired. I am going to call it a day here. Um, I'll do. I'll try and fiddle with the file system a bit to see if I can make this happier. Uh, even if it's just, you know, sh shrinking the logical file system. Um, it's very nearly working, which is why it's so frustrating that this is not. It does look like EF is now pointing at garbage, or rather it now contains garbage. And if EF is in a is a register variable, then that means that the stack frame's corrupted, which is annoying because that stuff's really hard to find. Uh, I suppose I could always dump part of the stack frame before and after each system call, because we're not actually dereferencing EF doing that. That would work fine. But I think that's something to look into next time. So. I hope you enjoyed this video, and please let me know what you think in the comments.